lots of controversy about black liberation theology. As I understand it, black liberation theology reads the Bible through the experience of people who have suffered and who then are able to say to themselves that we read the Bible differently because we have struggled than those do who have not struggled. Is that, is that a fair pith, uh, bumper sticker of, of liberation I think, theology? I think that's a fair bumper sticker. I think that the terms liberation theology or black liberation theology cause more problems and red flags for people who don't understand it. And it, when I hear the word black liberation theology being in the interpretation of scripture from the oppressor, I think, well, that's the Jewish story. Exactly. Too, right? exactly. From Genesis to Revelation. These are people who wrote the word of God that we honor and love under Egyptian oppression, Assyrian oppression, Babylonian oppression, Persian oppression, Greek oppression, Roman oppression. So that their understanding of what God is saying is very different from the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians. <laughs> and and that's, what, that's what prophetic theology of the African American church yeah, but is. Talk a little bit about that. The prophets loved Israel, but they hated the waywardness of Israel. And they were calling Israel out of love back to justice, exactly. not damning exactly. Israel, right? Right. They were saying that God would, in fact, if you look at the damning, condemning, if you look at Deuteronomy... Uh, it talks about blessings and curses, how God doesn't bless everything. God does not bless gangbangers. God does not bless dope dealers. God does not bless young thugs that hit old women upside the head and snatch their purse. God does not bless that. God does not bless the killing of babies. God does not bless the killing of enemies. And when you look at blessings and cursings that, out of that Hebrew tradition from the book of Deuteronomy, that's what the prophets were saying, that God is not blessing this. God does not bless it. Bless us. And when we're calling them, the prophets call them to repentance and to come back to God. If my people who are called by my name, God says to Solomon, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God says that. Wicked ways. Now, Jeremiah, right? <laughs> then will I hear from heaven. One of the most controversial sermons that you've preached is the sermon you preached that ended up being that soundbite about goddamn America. Where governments lie, God does not lie. Where governments change, God does not change. And I'm through now. But let me leave you with one more thing. Governments fail. The government in this text, comprised of Caesar, Quirinius, Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman government failed. The British government used to rule from east to west. The British government had a union jack. She colonized Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, and Hong Kong. Her navies ruled the seven seas all the way down to the tip of Argentina in the Falklands. But the British government failed. The Russian government failed. The Japanese government failed. The German government failed. And the United States of America government, when it came to treating her citizens of Indian descent fairly, she failed. She put them on reservations. When it came to treating her citizens of Japanese descent fairly, she failed. She put them in internment prison camps. When it came to treating the citizens of African descent fairly, America failed. She put them in chains. The government put them on slave quarters, put them on action block, auction blocks, put them in cotton fields, put them in inferior schools, put them in substandard housing, put them in scientific experience, experiments, put them in the lowest paying jobs, put them outside the equal protection of the law, kept them out of their racist bastions of higher education and locked them into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God bless America? No, no, no. Not God bless America. God damn America that's in the Bible for killing innocent people. God damn America for treating her citizens as less than human. God damn America as long as she tries to act like she is God and she is supreme. What, we, what did you mean when you said that? When you start confusing God and government, your allegiance is to government, a particular government and not to God, 
that you are in serious trouble because governments fail people and governments change and governments lie. And those three points of the, of the, of the sermon and that was the context in which I was illustrating uh, how the governments biblically and the governments since biblical times up to our time change how they fail and how they lie. And when we start talking about my government, right or wrong, I don't think that goes, that is consistent with what the will of God says or the word of God says. That governments, don't say right or wrong, that governments that want to kill innocents uh, are not consistent with the will of God. And that you are made in the image of God, you're not made in the image of any particular government. We have the freedom here in this country to talk about that publicly, where in some other places you're dead if you say the wrong thing about your, your government. Well, you can, you, you, you can be almost crucified for saying what you've said here in this country. That's true. That's true. Uh, but I, when I, you can be crucified. You can be crucified publicly. You can be crucified by corporate owned media. Uh, but I mean, when I, what I just meant was you can be killed in other countries by the government for saying that. Dr. King, of course, was vilified. And most of us forget that after he was, he was assassinated, but the year before he was assassinated, April 4th, 1967, at the Riverside Church, when he preached against the war in Vietnam, he talked about racism, militarism, and capitalism. He became vilified. He got ostracized not only by the majority of American in the press, he got vilified by his own community. They thought he had overstepped his bounds. He was no longer talking about civil rights and being able to sit down on lunch counters and that he should not talk about things like the war in Vietnam. He preached about... Lyndon Johnson was furious at that, as, sure you, he as you know. That's where they broke. And that's where a lot of the African-American community broke with him, too. He was vilified uh, by Roger Wilkins' daddy, Roy Wilkins. He was vilified by Jackie Robinson. He was vilified by all of the Negro leaders who felt he'd overstepped his bounds talking about an unjust war. Hmm. And... and um, that part of King is not lifted up every year, January 15th, 1963, I Have a Dream is lifted up. And passages from that sound bites, if you will, from that March on Washington speech. But the King, um, who preached the, the end of the, I have, I've been to the mountaintop, I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land, I may not get there with you. That part of the speech is talked about, not the fact that he was in Memphis siding with garbage collectors. Nothing about Resurrection City, nothing about... The poor. Resurrection City was the march in Washington for the poor. For the poor. Yeah. That part of King is not talked about uh, because we want to keep that away from the public eye and the public memory. And it's been 40 years now. What, what is your notion of why so many Americans seem not to want to hear the full money? They don't want to seem to acknowledge that a nation capable of greatness is also capable of cruelty. I think I come at that as a historian of religion, that we are miseducated as a people. And because we're miseducated, you end up with, with the majority of the people not wanting to hear the truth because they would rather cling to what they are taught. James Washington, a now deceased church historian, says that after every revolution, the winners of that revolution write down what the revolution was about so that their children can learn it, whether it's true or not. They don't learn anything at all about the Arawak. They don't learn anything at all about the Seminole, the, Creek, the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee. They don't learn anything. No, they don't learn that. What they learn is 1776, Christmas addicts would throw one black guy in there, um, fight against the British, the terrible. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal while we're holding slaves. Don't keep that part out. They learn that and they cling to that. And when you start trying to show them you, you only got a piece of the story. Let me show you the rest of the story. You run into vitriolic hatred because you, you're desecrating our myth. You're, you're desecrating what we hold sacred. And what you're holding sacred is a miseducational system that has not taught you the truth. I also think people don't understand condemn, D-E-M-N, D-A-M-N. They don't understand the root, the etymology of the word in terms of God condemning the, the practices that are against God's people. But again, you, what is happening is that I talk a truth, reading the scripture with a hermeneutic of a people who have hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is an interpretation. The window through which you're looking is your hermeneutic. And when you, when you don't realize that I, I've been framed, this whole thing has been framed through this window, there's another world out here that I'm not looking at or taking into account, it gives you a perspective that's, that, is, that is informed by and limited by 
your hermeneutic. Dr. James Cones puts it this way, the God of the people who are riding on the decks of the slave ship is not the God of the people who are riding underneath the decks as slaves in chains. That the God you're praying to bless our slavery is not the God to whom these pe people are praying, saying, God, get us out of slavery. 